today's program titled, Cost Sharing Reduction Reconciliation, Strategies for QHPs, Submitting Data This Spring. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a live question and answer session, and if you wish to ask a question live, you must be listening to this webinar on the telephone at that time. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by selecting the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen, and then type and send your question that way. For optimal sound quality, it is recommended that you listen to the conference via your telephone. Please don't forget to turn off your computer speakers if you choose to listen, to the, um, listen over the telephone. Look at the top left-hand column and click the speaker icon to turn the computer speakers on and off. If you choose to listen to the conference through your computer speakers and you experience any problems with the Internet sound quality, please dial back in on your telephone. Now I'd like to introduce for our host for today's call, Steve Davis. Mr. Davis, you may begin. Thanks, Wendy. Hello and welcome to today's program on cost sharing reduction reconciliation. Today's free webinar is sponsored by Sotheon. I'm Steve Davis, Managing Editor of Inside Health Insurance Exchanges and the AIS Report on Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, both of which are published by Atlantic Information Services in Washington, D.C. Health insurers have until April 30th to submit data to CMS on cost sharing reduction reconciliations. CMS delayed this requirement last year, which means carriers must now submit information on their qualified health plans for 2014 and 2015. And we've got a great panel lined up today to help you make sense of the rules. With me today is Eugene Sion, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Sotheon, Peter Polgar, growth strategy and business development manager of Sotheon, and John Kingsdale, managing director of Wakely Consulting Group. I'm sorry, Wakely Consultant Group, Consulting Group. And anyone who follows exchanges certainly knows John, who is founding executive director of the Commonwealth Health Insurance Connector Authority in Massachusetts. Their full bios are in your materials. You should have received an email containing a web link to the materials. It contains an outline for our program and the slides. If you did not get the packet, please click on the presentation tab to the left of your screen. You will see a copy of the presentation materials that you can print out. Also, during the program, we'd like, to, we'd like you to respond to some survey questions. After the presentation, we will open it up to your questions. And with that, let me hand things over to Eugene. Hi, Eugene. Thank you, Steve, and thank you very much once again. It is great to be here. Um, uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you are, we thank you very much for taking the time and joining us on this webinar. Um, this is one of our series of with AAS. We feel that's truly an honor and privilege to have you and, uh, join us today. Again, and Steve pointed out today, uh, I think the topic is a very, very much a, a timely topic. Um, ACA continues to be the kind of the headlines, if you will. As you probably heard it by now, that has exceeded 13 million lives uh, is a more realistic um, kind of a benchmark as we are going after this year as, and once the open enrollment ends. And the CSR is definitely a critical component to it. Um, and this is again, this is against the backdrop of the co-op issues um, as well as even uh, organizations like United, uh, the challenges around the ACA itself too. So before we continue um, deeper dive into the CSR, a little bit background on Sotheon for those of you have not been um, have not been up to date perhaps with what we do here. Uh, Sotheon is founded in year 2000. Uh, we have been a technology company in the forefront of um, ACA, I will say, uh, dating back to 2008. Um, we are a little over 100 people in here in New York. We are a 100% U.S.-based organization. And we currently work with uh, 50 or so plus health plans um, as we view the ACA as a supply chain transformation. As we have defined the, uh, the exchanges being the retail experience and the insurance carriers almost acting as the suppliers, as it has been the case for travel industry or other type of industries, the ACA has been really the, the disruptive or transformative process of creating this supply chain transformation. And in that context, um, as we will call our early adaptive insurance carriers, working with us side by side, and we are the Sotheon as the uh, remediation platform between the insurance carriers and the exchanges. Um, 
We are a cloud-based technology provider, which means that we hardly set foot to our carrier's data center. We don't ask them to buy any hardware and software, and we were able to um, enroll nearly a, uh, over a million lives uh, this year itself as well via a, uh, through ACA. Um, and we're expecting to grow up to 1.6 million lives um, by the time this open enrollment ends and few uh, business opportunities that we are working very closely becomes a real. Um, one of the aspects of uh, value proposition, once again, as, the, as a platform company, uh, we view this as a supply chain distribution platform. And uh, the payment processing and payment reform, coincidentally, was taking place in the eyes of um, companies like you know, PayPal's and uh, Squares and whatnot. And Softian has been at the front end, if you will, cutting edge of this kind of a, a convergence of healthcare reform with a payment reform so that we can provide a, a truly an end-to-end -end experience from enrollment to the payment to the effectuations through the Softian Cloud platforms. Um, as, as, as many of you know that, this is a very turbulent times. We've seen a lot of uh, stress um, not only on the carrier side but also on the vendor side. Again, a little bit of a peace of mind that we are very financially stable and growing very rapidly. Uh, more on our background in the healthcare space, um, Emblem Health has been a, a long time Softion client or partner. Uh, 3.5 million or so lives up in Northeast. And, and Softion has been working with Emblem dating back to 2003 and ensuring various aspects of ACA compliance all the way from SBC generations and streamlining the, uh, basically the product portfolio as we call it, um, as well as providing real time and, and, and more in line of uh, workflow automated enrollment and effectuation processes. Um, another, uh, another opportunity that we had the privilege of working, and this, this is how far we go back, uh, with the um, Health Connector being the nation's uh, first um, um, insurance exchange, and, and Softian has been a, a critical key players up there, and all the way from, again, call center um, and, uh, and the contact center operations and business operations as well as um, the ability to manage the uh, carrier connectivity. Massachusetts still continues to be the, the, the last remaining state where the, uh, the state is responsible of the premium billing applications and, and Softian is the underlying, as we call the, the plumbing and piping, if you will, and making that connectivity between the Hamas connector health insurance uh, for the premium billing reconciliations in the form of 820s. Um, and I will say probably more relevant to the topic of today's and ACA in general, as, as we have been trusted by Centene. Uh, Sofian has a working relationship with Centene. Uh, we currently connect them to, um, I don't know, the last count was I think about 14 or 15 different federal and state exchanges. And we truly feel uh, kind of privileged about that relationship as well too. Um, going back to Softion, so Softion is a, a cloud supply chain distribution platform. Um, these are the five main pillars, as we call it. Um, as the, the remediation platform, and this obviously mainly falls into the 834 enrollment remediation, uh, many of the health plans, I trust you are become very, uh, very familiar, if not too familiar, with all the challenges about the the cleansing and scrubbing of the 834 enrollment data, which has a significant downstream effect. If the data is not accurate, you end up having uh, enrollment span issues and coverage issues, if nothing else, billing, and then so on and so forth. So obviously, in this context, uh, our job has always been around keeping the data upstream, cleansing the data. In that context, in fact, our remediation platform, um, it only passes the 834s to the members uh, to the carriers, I should say, only upon the members' effectuation, which means basically you only see the clean, pristine member enrollment transactions in your core admin systems. And as we all know them, um, they're kind of as much of a, 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 a complicated, uh, very difficult to configure and tweak, given the fact that the ACA and CMS, um, there has been a daily changes to the platform, if you will, Softian platform, 
uh, has been the well suited and best fit, if you will, because of our rules engine capabilities and our ability to perform sometimes, if not even daily, and if not a weekly upgrades to our platforms, and uh, where that kind of operation is not really possible within the traditional context of enterprise IT infrastructures. Uh, premium billing and payment is another critical component to it. And again, there is a good backdrop to the CSR conversations. Of course, we're talking about basically the making sure that the enrollment transactions come downstream uh, successfully so that the, the billing is successful, uh, so that the consumer can pay their uh, premiums uh, without falling delinquent in the states, so losing their coverage. So as you can see, for those of you who have been in this space, and this is now our uh, third open enrollment, uh, three years of scars on our backs, having learned um, and a lot of many lessons, uh, all these components are very much are interrelated to with one another, and there's a great amount of dependency. Of course, the private exchange and direct enrollment are the, are the two additional topics of conversation, but we're not going to spend a lot of time because many of them response to the off exchange. Again, um, as a supply chain manager, our value is to our health plan, not just about the ACA, but we believe that the the transformation will kind of take a pendulum swing towards the private exchanges. So hence commonly known as the off exchange or private exchange solutions are also part of our product portfolio here as well. And the edge server is the area we want to spend a lot of time today. Uh, one of the things that we have seen, at least from a technology perspective, is that edge server carries many of the critical elements of including the CSR reconciliation and soon we will also start talking about the other type of business intelligence and data mining capabilities that we are experiencing, which basically is taking us down the road of, as we call it, a member level profit and loss statement, member level PL for short. What that really means is the analytics and the data mining capabilities that are being built around Edge Server, and Softion is the entity maintaining that responsibility for our carriers we are able to leverage and extend uh, those product and services to um, 80, 90 percent level to provide CSR reconciliation component to it. So uh, we'll talk about how we are able to do this in 30, 60, 90 days as, as, we, as, we, as we commit to it, if you will. And, and the, obviously the extending and leveraging the, the Softion platform, our business rules, it, it's, the, it's probably the, one of the biggest differentiators from a solutions uh, like others are available on the marketplaces. And then, of course, the member level PL really speaks about sustainability. A uh, little bit more of a background. So here we are, as we call it, uh, Softion is the kind of interstate highway of exchanges. If you think about this, interstate railways or highway system, um, we are able to connect all our carriers to every one of the federal and state exchanges. And once we are able to build that road, if you will, it's a, for us, it's a matter of putting more cars to the roads uh, because the infrastructure is already in place. Whereas the other experience or other type of practices we are seeing is that the little bit of carriers or vendors are building their own highways, if you will. Being a cloud-based platform, our, our systems are quite often, so we are able to onboard a new carrier to our entire platforms in now in matters of, again, 30, 60 days. Um, among our early adapters, uh, you can see you have a national coverage. Um, this is just a small number of sample of some of our carriers that we work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, the, another distinction is we're not just an enrollment system, or we're not just a billing system, or we're not just an analytics. We are the platform with an end-to-end, -end, totally integrated, and handling every aspect of consumerism. Anything that touches the member, we are able to provide those products and services as a white label uh, component or a business unit of our health insurance carriers. So we feel, again, quite proud and privileged to be uh, trusted by so many early adapters, innovators. So I'm going to jump over to the topic of today. Um, I think I've given enough background on this topic. So the CSR overview, at this point, we have a, a kind of a, before we even deeper dive into this thing, we have a little uh, three-part survey altogether. So Wendy, I believe, is going to take over and prompt you for our first survey question, which will be the topic is that the, 
What is your biggest concern with CSR reconciliation? Okay, what is your biggest concern with CSR reconciliation? Is it option one, meeting the April 30th, 2016 deadline, limited information available on this topic, readjunction of claims, or option four, resource IT constraint? Again, I'll give you a few more seconds. What is your biggest concern with the CSR re reconciliation? And not to our surprise that uh, the, the claims rejudication is a major concern. Uh, this is not just obviously unique to this audience. Um, as you know quite well, the, you know, what made you successful last year is not going to guarantee your success. In the case of, we heard that from so many different insurance carriers. And to be frank with you, this speaks to the core aspect of the core admin systems, as we call them, let it be Trizetos of the world or AMESIS and DSTs. Um, I think it's no surprise to us to see that the claims rejudication is the one major hurdle because the fact that none of these admin systems has the ability to uh, perform these functions, of course, and the, the subsequent to this process, by the way, today we do this for all our carriers, most of our carriers, I should say, which is the, the risk score aspect of the three R's uh, as well, the risk adjustment, risk corridors, or, and reinsurance. As part of it, that our goal is to help our health plan create a sustainable, successful exchange operations. So we are analyzing those risk scores before and after being submitted to the CMS. And the same context of that capability, those capabilities, and probably more will be coming down the CMS. We'll continue to put an additional tax and burden in those core admin systems. So uh, I think that we just confirmed the fact that the rejudication of the claims, along with the um, kind of the limited information, the lack of clear requirements, it continues to be a big challenge. And hopefully today's webinar is going to give you some more clarity around the, the information topic altogether. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn over to my colleague here, Pete Polgar. And Pete is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my apologies. I'm turning over to John, John, John Kingsdale. Um, again, I think for many of you know John quite well. And uh, John, would you mind uh, taking over the slide, sir? Certainly. Thank you, Eugene. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to be very brief. I just want to provide a little context for the um, deep dive that uh, the rest of the program is going to provide on cost sharing reduction reconciliation. Um, and, the con and what I just wanted to point out is that this is one of the more convoluted, complex, daunting processes created for carriers by the ACA. Uh, and it's a big deal. It's um, uh, over half of the marketplace enrollees receive uh, cost sharing reductions. So that means uh, 3 to 4 million for 2014, and as of mid-year 2015, uh, 5.6 million, or 56%, were receiving CSRs uh, through the exchanges. Um, and so uh, for those of you who are participating as issuers, that if you're the typical issuer, more than half of your um, premium revenue needs to be uh, trued up, if you will, for the cost of uh, the cost sharing reductions. In uh, non-Medicaid expansion states, so that's now down to uh, 20 or 21, um, that's going to be even more, about two-thirds of enrollees, uh, because of course they're eligible down uh, to 100 percent of FPL. About two-thirds will are receiving CSRs. And the average value uh, of CSRs, we estimate to be about $1,500 per recipient, um, even more in the um, Medicaid non-expansion states. So that's uh, in the range of about $5 billion for 2014, and seven to as much as $9 billion uh, in revenue for 2015. Obviously, quite a handy sum. Um, the um, 2014 advance payments uh, ba are based on uh, URRT filings, which may be off considerably. Um, first of all, as I think we all recognize, there was a, um, a modest base uh, database on which two uh, carriers could uh, predict claims and uh, 
and and uh, costs um, for their uh, 2014 CSR recipients, and then uh, we used the federal calculator as well, which had some inaccuracies. So we've seen um, car issuers be off by as much as 15% in both directions uh, once they begin to reconcile um, their uh, advance payments to their actual. Uh, payments due for CSSRs. So, uh, CSR, sorry. So, I, I think this is um, not only complex, uh, but uh, unfortunately, it is a very big deal as well. So, let me let me turn it back to uh, Eugene and his colleague, and and uh, that's uh, just a little bit of a context uh, for those of you who are interested in why this really counts. And thank you, John. Um, it's great insight. And just to add on to some of the John's comment, in fact, um, again, on a rel relatively related topic, today we receive a, another guidance from CMS and urging the carriers to start implementing uh, a monthly recurring enrollment reconciliation process. And again, uh, and to the fact that the, if this submission does not pass the validation or meet the standards, the process of fluctuations or cancellation required, uh, to reconcile these files at least twice per month, um, the carrier will then be subject to uh, basically uh, penalties in the form of uh, receiving those policy-based payments. So uh, as you can see across the board, um, CMS is actually uh, looking to, in a way, kind of tighten the belt and the, obviously those effects has as a, as, a, as a significant implications on the carrier's operation. And CSR is no different to that operation. We believe that is just one of many challenging, very complex piece of the puzzle altogether. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to turn over to one of our colleagues here at Softion, Pete Polgar. Pete has joined us, Softion. Uh, and I'll, in fact, let him introduce himself very briefly. Um, and he is one of our subject matters um, on the topic specialist on this topic of CSR. Pete? Great. <clears throat> thanks, Eugene. So yes, uh, thanks for the introduction, Eugene. Um, prior to Softion, I I'm coming from uh, one of the big four um, uh, consulting firms, and uh, I've worked mostly in uh, strategic accounts in the payers group. So I want to briefly discuss what is CSR. So I just want to just level set this uh, entire audience on this. So essentially, a CSR is a discount that lowers the amount you have to pay out of pocket for deductibles, coinsurance, and copayments. And it also will lower your out-of-pocket maximum. <clears throat> and you get this cost share reduction based on your income level and it has to meet a certain standard. As you can see, uh, the level is uh, broken down into four tiers under the silver tier plan. And it's uh, silver CSR 7, or it would be silver 70, and then it would be silver CSR 73, 87, and 94. So what does that mean? So essentially, if you look at silver 70, that is the base plan. So that is 70% of the responsibility is on the QHP, and then 30% of that is, is a member responsibility. Now, if you look at it, you can see 73, 87, 94. The member responsibility is reduced 27%, 17%, and 7% respectively. And <clears throat> So essentially what happens is the QHP issuer will be taking that responsibility and will have to reconcile that information and then uh, CMS or the government will, will essentially give you that money back once you do your reconciliation. Now, so we've also um, at Softion, and we've heard just, you know, just talking with some, you know, industry experts, we've been asked a few times, you know, and this has been discussed, why not, why, sh why shouldn't we just follow the Massachusetts model? And what Massachusetts is doing is they're providing gold and platinum coverage for eligible enrollees based on their income level. So, for example, in Massachusetts, the platinum level, uh, you can get a platinum level coverage if you meet the standard, if you meet the FPL of 100% to 175%. And for gold, you have to meet the standard of 175% and 250% FPL. Um, you know, so this is still up in the air. You know, it's a, it's a great topic, but uh, we believe this may give off um, the wrong impression to the public as, you know, some will be paying full price for a platinum level coverage and it may just uh, cause more issues um, in the eyes of the public. Okay. So now, um, as you are aware, you have seen uh, the Edge server and the three R's as Eugene mentioned prior to that. So um, the three R's, uh, as you know, two of them will be disappearing, which is uh, the reinsurance and the, re and the risk corridors. Um, and, this, and, and essentially, these two were really to stabilize the market, right? So we really had you know, a lot of new un, 
uh, you know, a lot of new members that were rolling into the ACA, and we had no um, history or medical history on these members. So the government provided these two to really stabilize the market and really make sure that, hey, if, if you have a member that has unknown um, issue, uh, unknown uh, medical issues and incurs high costs, we would, they would be um, covered by the government, which is the reinsurance. Now, um, those two will be disappearing after this year. So what's going forward? The risk adjustment. So the risk adjustment is really just a form of premium sta stabilization that the payment transfers from issuers with a lower risk population to a higher risk population. So essentially it just balances out the, the risk uh, populations for all QHPs that are in the ACA. Now, as you can see, the cost share reduction is right to the right. Um, that, is, that is where um, that will be continuing going forward just as a risk adjustment. And this is uh, essentially the two strategies going forward in the new uh, reformed market. <clears throat> and f finally, you know, we, we, we noticed that uh, April 30th is the deadline for 2016 for the 2014 and 2015 calendar year. But going forward, we believe, uh, I think we believe that 2017, it will be April 30th, but going forward, we believe this will change. But um, with time, um, everything has changed in the market, and, uh, we, and we have to uh, do it first before we can uh, really figure out what works best. Okay. All right, great. So our next uh, survey question. Okay, Wendy, next question is, uh, okay, back to you, ma'am. Okay, which reconciliation method has your organization selected? Option one, simplified method, or option two, standard method? We'll give everybody a few minutes to put in their answer again. Which reconciliation method has your organization selected? Again, it's not the surprise in here. We're seeing almost a uh, one to three ratio that the majority of the health plans uh, last couple of years have chosen the last year, I should say 2014, 2015, obviously, the, the standard method, uh, just for the same exact reasons why we're having this conversation, because the, uh, the I'm sorry, the simple method, the standard method is extremely complicated. It requires a lot more uh, real-time calculations or more data analytics, whereas the, the, as you know, the simple method is based on actuarial value and a PMPM. PM. So once again, no surprises in here, but as you all know quite well, um, there is a conversation that uh, the simple method could be extended by another year, uh, but it ultimately is an inevitable that every health plan has to implement the standard model, standard method CSR calculations. So once again, um, another no surprise in here. So with that in mind, we'll proceed to our implementation by comparing standard to simple method. Back great. to you, Pete. Great, thanks. So um, actually, that's great news uh, so that we are seeing that it, standard method is the more favored. Uh, we actually predicted that would be the case, so this slide makes really um, perfect sense. So um, as Eugene discussed, you know, the, simp uh, the simplified method will be dis uh, disappearing after um, this year, but that is still pending, as he said. Um, but let's, you know, we, we kind of want to talk about the standard uh, method. So what makes this, the standard method so challenging? It is the re-adjudication of claims. And we understand that, you know, a lot of these systems are not built to um, re-adjudicate claims as almost as dummy claims, as they would say. Um, so really, we need to figure out how that happens. And why, why did CMS want to do this? And CMS did release an initial report about a few years ago that showed that the standard method is actually the cheaper, um, the cheaper version, and it's the more accurate version, and it helps both the QHP issuer and, the, and CMS to do the reconciliation. So it is more of a long-term investment, and that is why the standard method is going forward. So. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so I'm a visual person, and, and a lot of our, our colleagues are, so we kind of wanted to really just break this down, and really, what is the standard method, and how does it look? So um, I want to walk through uh, a standard method, um, one claim for the standard method, and I'm going to keep it at a higher level, so I don't want to use any complicated language, so I just want to keep it you know, as high as level as possible. So I'm going to introduce you to Chris. He is, uh, he is a Silver CSR member. Um, he has a plan deductible of $500 and a coinsurance, um, it, and coinsurance is 10% after the deductible is met. So we have noticed that Chris is not a very careful person, and throughout the year he has 
few minor injuries, and claims have totaled about $500. So, but then again, he, like we said, he's not careful and he has broken his foot and he gets a claim of $400. Since Chris has already met his deductible, his coinsurance applies. So as you can see in the far right column, his total out-of-pocket for this claim is $40. Now, if we want to re-adjudicate these claims, and we have to put Chris on the silver, CS, uh, the silver base plan, um, <clears throat> you can see that the base plan's deductible has increased from $500 to $1,000. And again, the same 10% coinsurance is applied after his deductible is met. So he has the same claims history of the $500, and, um, prior, and then he gets the $400 um, claim for breaking his foot. Since his deductible is not met and his deductible is currently standing at $900, he owes the entire $400 amount. So in so total, he has paid $400. Now, the difference between these two costs is $360. So that is a really high level of how we walk through this, but really, we want to break this down into a simple format so that we are transparent with our reporting. So you may be asking, how do we do this? So we will uh, basically talk about at a high level what Softion is doing currently and how we're doing this. And we actually have this uh, process called the ghost adjudication process. Essentially what we're doing is we're re-adjudicating 100% re of these claims and we're leveraging our best, best business practices from, uh, from our edge server analytics uh, solution. And, and that is how we're able to re-adjudicate these claims and really understand what's going on. So. <clears throat> Once we re-adjudicate these claims, you know, well, we, are, we love to be transparent with our, our issuers. So we actually do provide um, full transparency to our, our information and, and the, our carriers are able to look at what's going on with the CSR. So now I'm going to break it down into the four steps. So how do we do this? First, we have to receive all enrollment medical, pharma, uh, medical and pharmaceutical claims from the QHP issuers. Uh, this is this is a really uh, important aspect. We do accept multiple formats, and uh, we want to make, make this process very simple for the QHP issuer. So once we get that, um, this, is, this has been one of our most important, most valuable um, uh, steps, which is step two, is where we validate member enrollment spans against the medical and pharmaceutical claims. And the reason we do this is we've noticed that um, there's, there's been some data issues or anything that's going on. We want to make sure that if there's any gaps in coverage, membership churns, loss of coverage, anything that is happening, we want to make sure that, that the QHP issuer is getting the fair and most honest um, uh, reimbursement for their um, members. So once that is complete, we actually go to, that's when, once we do that, we actually have our ghost adjudication process, which is unique to our, which is unique to Softion, and that is how we are using our business rules engine. Then finally, we actually provide our um, <clears throat> QHP issuers with the information and a breakdown of each claim at the member level. So, every, so everything is fully transparent. You can see what has happened throughout um, the life cycle of this XYZ um, CSR member. Okay. No. Okay, now we have our and third and final survey question for you. Okay, the third one is, how is your organization handling CSR reconciliation? Option one, developing a process in-house. Option two, utilizing an outside vendor. Or option three, haven't decided. Again, how is your organization handling CSR reconciliation? Again, once again, I think that there is no surprise in here, too. Uh, we see a lot of the organization, and not to mention that um, being a very uh, a recent uh, problem, if you will, uh, there is definitely a, a not much of a vendor solution availability on the on the market itself, and we're seeing more and more organizations uh, bringing this as, a, as an in-house uh, process effort altogether too. Uh, one thing again to be as a caveat, uh, we expect the rules to change quite often, and we also understand that uh, there might be later down the road some additional complications. Uh, we all know that. Uh, a capitated, for instance, claims. How do you calculate the, uh, the out-of-pocket expenses on those conditions or paid amount conditions uh, versus the, the contract amount and out-of-networks and so on and so forth? Uh, so it is, in essence, basically 
we believe the uh, investing in into the existing IT technologies is definitely uh, something that to be considered, but hoping that uh, we are able to uh, articulate, as to Pete's point, a rules engine element of uh, our platform, for instance, platform like Softion. And by the way, Softion is not the only company does this, if you will. Um, and the, the rules engine are designed to be basically um, it's for uh, designed for change. Um, so we expect the the rules will be coming down to the CMS will be changing over time, and which will in turn uh, will may actually require you to make constant uh, modification to to your existing processes as far as this this term that you know P, credit to Pete and the team the the term that we are now using a uh, ghost education ultimately is something that is going to be very critical too well thank you again Wendy um, so we'll proceed with our final slide in here uh, perhaps again another way to look at this data and um, and uh, you can see here and this is what is being implemented by Softion for most of our carriers, uh, that as part of our day-to-day -day operations for those carriers that we work with, uh, we are receiving their A34s, and, and we are the source of truth uh, for those systems altogether. But um, as, a, as, a, as a master data model that we have put in place, um, so we have the ability to also uh, take the medical and claim data at, at minimum, um, but moreover, for those carriers that they've been trusting Softion for the CSR implementations only, uh, we then build a, basically a system of records, not necessarily the system of truth for the enrollment data. And so we are able to map all that data set to the Softion's uh, data repository on the cloud. Um, this is very much like in line with with Edge Server. That's really what you how you submit your enrollment data and how you do your claim data for the edge server submissions for those of you who are familiar with the process. So we are extending that data set definition to support some few additional data elements, uh, including, the, including the product benefits and design. So for the calculation of that uh, baseline silver benefits and products and whatnot too. And, and so to this date, you can see again, and for those of you who are looking to build a process in-house, this is perhaps a, a, a kind of a blueprint that you may want to adapt. Uh, we are more than happy to uh, basically provide some guidance and support if you needed to. Uh, we urge you to reach out at the end, final slide. You will see our contact information. Uh, so we urge the audience to reach out for any additional question. You may have it after this, this webinar. Um, we are able to take the data sets, and we, of course, fulfill and satisfy the edge server requirements. And what we are doing is, as you can see, we have the business rules engine element to it. We are implementing, as we speak, the, the, the ghost education business rules. Um, and we feel very confident that we will meet all deadlines. And the final product of that will be the, basically the, the data set for the CSR submissions. And if you look at a little further to the right, you will see another term that I think that I have kind of uh, I'll let you know in advance that the in a few few minutes ago the the term that uh, that we are start to see and hear a lot more, which is the really the the exchange sustainability. Let it be on the uh, retailer side from the state's point of view, but more so on the insurance carrier side. As we all know, the the the, the issues about the risk adjustments and and how it affected. The, the, the basically the, the closure of um, many, many, many co-ops. And, and I know that the problem, by the way, exists that's not just the limited to co-ops. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough depth in the organization being such a new organization, each and every one of them. But we know that the, the risk adjustment will continue to be a, a pain point, and so will the CSR. Uh, if you don't do well, and the, the big distinction between the CSR and then the, and the risk adjustments CSR, you have the full control. It's your, it's, it's your responsibility to be able to articulate and present your case to, excuse me, to CMS for additional those reconciliation amounts. So we believe the sustainability is going to be a key point to those things. And if I may uh, give you a little bit of a sneak preview, if you will, what we mean by sustainability. You're looking to some of our analytics 
component to it, um, which we are able to bring down that profit loss statement uh, down to a, a county level, uh, down to a zip code, uh, or not just the member level, but also at the at the product level or even at the provider level. So uh, we continue to invest. Um, we have a lot of young and bright minds in here uh, every day. They're looking at how we can make this process better, how we can ensure our partner, our health plan's success, if you will, in exchanges. Today's a public exchange has been known. We all know that there are some few also pending resolutions uh, from coming from CMS. One being that critical one is a eligibility verification as a service. Pending upon that, uh, the distinction between the private and public exchanges will disappear, which means that we're going to start seeing more and more uh, businesses, more and more membership through this supply chain based retail driven uh, health exchange models altogether. We believe this is the this is the future. So with that in mind, we are uh, ready for your questions at this time. Great. Thanks Eugene. And let me turn it over to Wendy to explain how to ask a question. Wendy? Thanks Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question via the web presentation, please select a chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen and then type and send your question that way. If you'd like to ask a question via the telephone, please press star 1 on your telephone now and you'll be placed in the queue in the order received. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press star 1 again. I'll announce each caller prior to bringing you into the conference. Please remember that if you have your phone on mute that you take it off mute when you're selected to ask your question. So again, to ask a question via the web presentation, please select the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen and then type and send your question that way. And let's see. Steve, at this time, we don't have any live callers. I'll let you know if we get any in the um, Q&A pod. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, let's take a, uh, a question from the chat pod. Um, and, and maybe, Peter, this is one that, uh, that you can start out with. How do you handle capitated claims for the standard method? Thanks, Steve. So um, actually, this is a great question. We've had this asked a few times. So we, there's actually an indicator on the enrollment file when we receive, uh, and it's, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the section, but there is an indicator that, that identifies that this member uh, or this claim has received, um, that the claim is a capitated claim. So our business rules engine does identify that, and then we actually have, you know, our internal process will actually capture that information and uh, um, adjust accordingly. Great, yeah. thanks. Any, anything to add to that, uh, Eugene or John? So the, uh, basically, the, in fact, we're able to make that distinction at the detailed service lines, if you will, um, so that if particular services have subject to capitations and some are not, um, our rules engine is, uh, is, is designed to handle that level of granularity, if you will, and being able to handle that uh, paid amount versus the actual amount and so on and so forth. So, yeah, the short answer is yes, it is something that you need to consider as part of your um, uh, re-adjudication or ghost adjudication of your claims for the CSR reconciliation. That's a great question and it is an important one, yes. Thank you. Another question, uh, how do you handle Indian variation plans? Is that something you can address? Um, I must confess, this not, has not come up. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a lack of our plans in this space. It's a good one. It's a good, tricky one. Um, we do know that the you know Indian um, being the declaring as an in, in American Indian uh, deems you to a different cost variances at the time of the enrollment process and the subsidy calculations. So uh, I do believe that that is a, a, a value that we we receive through the enrollments and as well as through the what we call the um, the PCM, the QHP surf template. We failed to mention that, by the way. Um, one of the things that about Softion, we are also a web-based entity, web broker entity. So if you're a health plan in one of the FFM states, uh, we already have your QHPs and surf templates, and and we do have most of the surf templates and some of the the state exchanges as well. So. The product definitions and combining with the enrollment data, we are able to articulate your cost variance uh, at the enrollment level, and that will be then calculated as a, as, as a final reconciliation piece after the post ghost adjudication component to it, and the cost variances a, uh, and the comparison against the baseline silver plans will be implemented part of the our rule sets. So yes, we do that. I'm happy to provide more detailed information if I may ask the audience to send us a an email. Uh, maybe I will fast forward. Our 
context information here, Pete and I. So we look forward to hearing back from you about a particular question you may have. Great. Thanks, Eugene. Another question, is there a way to perform the CSR reconciliation without running claims through a re-adjudication re process? Uh, so if you are doing this, uh, the simplified method, um, yes, you can do that. But if you're doing the standard method, uh, it is a CMS requirement that you must re-adjudicate 100% of the claims. Uh, there's no way around it. Um, so if you don't want to re-adjudicate, um, you know, the only two options, if you can't re-adjudicate it in-house, you will have to look for an outside vendor or you will have to go with the, the simplified method. But there's no way around the re-adjudication of claims. Great. Thank you, Peter. Any, anything to add to that, Eugene or John? And, and John, I'm just curious, did you have a, a CSR reconciliation uh, in the early years of the connector? Is that something you had to deal with? And, and if so, what were the challenges that you faced? No, um, and I think it was Peter who referenced this. Um, we actually had, a, frankly, a far simpler approach, which was um, we had a different uh, uh, benefit different cost sharing levels by income and uh, uh, a different level of premium subsidy so that the initial ongoing monthly capitation uh, or pre premium payment to the what you would call the issuer today um, for an enhanced benefit level and reduced cost sharing was built right into the um, the, the the uh, whole benefit level and the whole and the whole premium, so there's no need to reconcile uh, some add-on. It's it's interesting. Uh, I, I think the uh, interesting question to which the answer I believe is mostly political: Why Congress uh, chose to um, go this route with what is a pretty complicated uh, reconciliation process that we simply uh, avoided by enhancing. Um, uh, the value of the of the benefits for the lower income folks. Okay, good. Thanks, John. Uh, another question: uh, Do most plans have a surplus in the CSR accounts? In other words, they receive more CSR than was expected. Well, that's potentially the case. Um, if I'm mean, in a in the simple method altogether, too. Uh, maybe I'll again defer this back to. To John as well too, uh, but again, the standard methods is gonna is yet to be known. Uh, or I'll refer back to my colleagues in here, both Pete and John. Great. Um, so yeah, just to add to that, um, and this is just from our experience. We've actually uh, some of our current uh, clients that we're working with, uh, they opted originally for the simplified method, and then once we just started to discuss, you know, that we are offering the CSR the solution for the standard method, uh, their in-house uh, experts actually did calculations and they noted that it was significantly higher to go with um, the standard method uh, and that is just, um, I'm not sure how they calculate, but they did note that it's significantly higher, not just because of the cost of you know, doing the, sim uh, the simplified method with the hiring actuaries, but in general just the reimbursement. It's just a, a more accurate approach rather than just taking the average of all the claims. Thanks, Peter. Another question, are you able to do both state and federal CSR reconciliations? Um, our focus right now is on the federal side, being that the CMS mandate that requires altogether two. Maybe, again, I may have to take this question offline. Uh, wasn't aware that any specific states. Uh, John, do you have anything that you can add to that area, any specific state-level submission of CSR data? You know, I'm not uh, aware. I know uh, there are a couple of states like Massachusetts that do special premium support um, and add um, their own premium stream so as to reduce the premium burden on uh, certain uh, enrollees. But I have to confess I'm not aware right. of any states that do a CSR reconciliation uh, other than the federal one. Right. I mean, the, to add to John's comments, that the, we do know that there are state-level RAP subsidies, uh, both in Massachusetts and, I believe, Washington as well, too. Uh, but they are on the premium side, analogous to uh, tax credits as you receive, the members receive on the premium side, but not on the cost-sharing side. But again, we'll take this question, maybe uh, consult with some of our, some of our internal um, experts in here. Good. Let's take another one. Uh, you mentioned, I think it was Peter that mentioned, 
that you were seeing a 15% uh, variance between the advance payments received versus what would be expected via the information from the URRT. Could you explain what was driving this variance? So I think this is John. I, I mentioned that. Okay. And um, I have to say this is only for a handful of clients that uh, Wakely has, has done the reconciliation for. Uh, but primarily, uh, well, I shouldn't say primarily. Um, we know at least two things that are driving it. And one is that um, the claims, historical claims uh, data on which uh, carriers could estimate um, the advance payments was uh, really just not uh, very good, very robust. And there were a number of problems, uh, secondly, with the federal calculator that plans used. Um, and so uh, those have led to some discrepancies between what uh, was filed initially uh, for advance payment and what we're seeing on reconciliation. There may be other things driving it, but those are at least two. Okay. Good. And Peter, uh, Eugene, any any comment on that question? No, no, I think John covered it. Okay. Another question from the chat pod. What are some types of validations that you are performing over claims populations? Sure. Um, I think this kind of, uh, Peter mentioned that about that a little earlier. Uh, number one is that, first of all, um, not just the claims, but the enrollment, we want to make sure that the uh, remember, enrollment spans is, is always a is, is been a big challenge, especially with all the with all the challenges that C our friends from CMS is throwing around the a lot of the retroactivities or whether or not the members are not making their payment on a timely basis, and and they ask us to basically simply um, you know the the, uh, the the delay the or or put off the uh, effectuation dates by 30 days so they can hopefully they'll make their payments next week or next month. So in lieu of that, we need to make sure that enrollment spans are accurately corrected, and therefore the the incoming claims has to basically uh, validate it against those enrollment spans altogether too. Um, again, we're talking about small number of memberships uh, around those retro retroactive. Um, uh, enrollments or terminations, and those are the conditions that we validate it because those will be then rejected uh, by CMS should we fail to do so. And those are the, probably the most important two aspects against the claim against that, against the member enrollment records altogether. Furthermore, uh, we also have the ability to uh, verify and validate it. Basically, you know, the the, the members uh, responsible portions, uh, maximum out of pocket accumulations, and also the ordering uh, and, and processing of the claims uh, or goes to the claims in the exact order so that the, uh, the MOPs could be calculated on an effective basis altogether too. So we have several, several validation rules that we put in place today. Again, significant portion of them we are leveraging from our edge server platforms and now we're adding this additional claims validation rules. Good. Thank you, Eugene. And, uh, Another comment on uh, sort of on that in that same area. What are the validation steps slash opportunities issuers get to see on Sophion's output data set? And part two of that question is: Do you present output to compare simplified and standard methodology for an issuer? Uh, so number one is that platform is very much a, a very much open system altogether. So we of course share all the data and the. As we encounter these exceptions in, in the, let it be a data validation exceptions or not, um, what we do is we work with our carrier plans um, basically side by side and correcting those um, exceptions, if you will, and then reapplying the, the, the rule sets once again until we receive a, a satisfactory response altogether to. Uh, the question about, you know, uh, us voluntarily performing the the simple method calculations. Uh, actually, that has crossed our minds, and there are some conversations as we speak, but that is not something that we do currently. But um, I guess depending upon the audience and depending upon the, um, the, the demand, if you will, uh, it is something that we are very much eager to. And to be frank with, um, we have some several conversations, including with John and Wakely Group. As you know, they are, they are the, 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 the leading authority on the on the simple method calculations altogether, but uh, that's not something we offer today, but we are definitely considering. Good. Thank you. 
I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Uh, here's one. Would you say that in general advanced payments are excessive when compared to expected recoveries regardless of the methodology used? Um, advanced payments, I guess the audience is referring to the simple method, method payments that they receive on a PM PM basis. If that is the case, that uh, we, we believe that actually some of the payers might have been uh, kind of shorted themselves on the, because remember, it was all based on actuarial values altogether. And uh, we all know that um, that data set has been some, has some flaws in it altogether. And, uh, and we all know that the, uh, the utilization uh, has been much higher than what it anticipated. And to be honest with you, that was the, that was the problem with the co-op issues that they, they did not get the, the proper risk adjustments from the other carriers, um, quote unquote, supposedly doing well. But it turned out to be not that many plans actually carriers were doing well, so they only received 12% of what they were expecting for. Uh, so that is, I think, the overall, uh, we believe that there's an overarching opportunity for uh, carriers to actually receive additional funds uh, through the CSR reconciliation standard model calculations. So this is John. Um, there's also uh, the issue of how much is our carriers getting monthly as advance payments versus how much would they, are they due or do they owe back um, based on either the simple or the standard uh, method of reconciliation. And uh, our experience with a handful of carriers uh, so far is that when comparing the simplified method with um, the original filing and, and the mo advanced monthly payment, uh, is that the reconciliation difference has run in both directions. So sometimes they've been overpaid relative to the simplified reconciliation method and sometimes underpaid. Thanks, John. Another question uh, for Peter or Eugene. You referred to your claims engine rules-based. Uh, do you utilize your own rules or take the payer's processing rules? So there are standard rules that obviously have, we have implemented. Um, we heavily relied upon our rules engine. It just enables us to make some very quick, agile changes in face of the you know, kind of changing landscape or the data and the exceptions that as we see it all together. So the, the tools that we use is the Softeons rules engine kind of has been tested and designed and proven to operate in the ACA world as we use it every day for over a million plus lives being during the enrollment process or permitting billing or delinquencies or reconciliation on the ad server side altogether too. Um, and then we will of course that, you know, not every plan has the same exact adjudication logics. We've seen so many different variations from uh, provider integrated health plans model to more managed care model altogether. So, um, and of course, that part of our design effort is to uh, bring what we call our best business practices. So we are able to share with you what other, you know, 30, 40 health plans are using, to be frank with you. And the challenge is, of course, that, you know, why do you think you are different? And, but of course, we are very much eager to hear what makes us, you know, any, anything that makes us better. We are all open to those ideas and suggestions. And if there are any unique circumstances that carriers are facing as part of their adjudication logic or their contracts or whatever that might be with the providers, um, that we will try to implement those as part of our rule sets. And, and fortunately, we're able to do those changes in, in very responsive and agile manner. Excellent. Uh, another question for you, Eugene. This is a pretty easy one. Uh, how many issuers are utilizing Softion for claim re-adjudication for CSR? Um, as, as we stand, a little over a dozen right now we're working with. Um, and again, we have, as I said, we're 50 plus health plans we work with. And um, in all honesty, you know, Softian has been a kind of a new to this game altogether. Uh, some of our plans have chose to stay with their core admin systems and they are trying to expect maybe the next release and service pack they receive from core admin systems uh, can do this task on their behalf. We're also seeing some, uh, another, um, you know, the group of carriers are piggybacking this thing onto their, uh, let it be, here is NCQA type of uh, analytics uh, companies or risk management companies, and they are letting them build up this on an additional layer. Uh, the, the distinction that we make is, you know, 
we are the platform. Uh, in essence, that you know, more data that comes through down our platforms, more membership flows. It, it's just like the kind of the internet, the Googles of the world, the search engines, like the effect of social media. So we are able to actually compare and contrast with your data sets, of course, with your consent to the other demographics, other memberships, down to at the service area level or at the highest plan level, definitely at the at the QHP or the carrier level. So uh, we are we are getting a lot of inquiries. Um, this is another seems to be another uh, one of those rush 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 items, if you will. And this is only another another chapter in our in our in our offering, if you will. We are already contemplating on offering the similar services for the 820 reconciliation. Remember, there's going to be the next one coming up very shortly after, and the thereafter, um, we're talking about monthly enrollment reconciliations. And some point in time, we're talking about uh, a monthly a claims reconciliation as well. So. This is the new normal. Uh, you just need to basically get used to it, and we believe that um, we have invested over 15 plus years in this uh, business, if you will, and we are simply extending and leveraging those skill sets that we have developed over the years rather than being just an opportunistic. But there are parts that, again, as I said, um, and, and, and clearly there is enough opportunity to really everyone to step up and show their core competencies. and. So far, over a dozen or so health plan trusted us for our uh, CSR implementation. Great. And we are uh, at the top of the hour. So thanks, Eugene, Peter, and John. Uh, lots of great information to process and, and some great questions. Sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them. But I suspect, I suspect that our friends at Sophion will respond to your questions if we didn't get, them to, get to them today. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Yeah, Contact information is there. Um, including our cell phones. Uh, that's how open we are. So just as a testimonial to our commitment. But uh, if you can kindly send them in the form of an email, and I'll try to respond to your <laughs> phone calls as well too. Uh, but we will be definitely uh, promptly get back to you. Terrific. Great. Well, thanks to our speakers and to our attendees. Have a nice afternoon, everybody, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. And stay warm, everybody. <laughs>